Pride and Prejudice doesn't have much of a plot until about the midpoint of the book when Mr. Darcy tells Elizabeth Bennet, I love you most ardently. And she tells him to jump in a lake, which he does in one of the miniseries. Hi, I'm MK Anderson. I am the managing editor of Onyx Path Publishing, and when I'm not spending my time in my editing cave looking lovingly at the Chicago Manual of Style, I am occasionally also a writer. Most recently, I wrote for a tabletop RPG called They Came From the RPG Anthology. They Came From as a series lets you parody your favorite genres, and in this one, we have five different genres instead of the usual one. I wrote the costume drama chapter. This video is an outcropping of the research I did for that book, so if you enjoy it, you might want to check out the Kickstarter below. You already know this story, right? Elizabeth Bennet is kind of a free spirit from an already kind of wild family who meets a jerk at a party who blows her off. She holds a grudge for months as she keeps running into this guy over and over again in social situations. He's kind of cold and kind of a douche, and he talks about always holding these operatic grudges, and she calls him on his crap a little bit, but it's not because she's like secretly into him. She is irritated by him. So when he comes to her saying, I love you, I love you despite your horrible, trashy family, I love you despite my better judgment, I have done everything I could except for marry you and I need you to put me out of my misery, she says not just no, but hell no. I mean, like, in a very English way, in a very muted English way. She throws back into his face that a childhood friend of his, Mr. Wickham, was badly mistreated by him, and of course, she couldn't marry a guy who is not just, like, cold, but actively cruel. And he accepts that, you know, she has no interest in him, but he writes her a letter saying, this is what happened with Mr. Wickham. He tried to run off with my teen sister. And she starts seeing him in a different light. All he'd really done was be kind of rude to her at a party, so she starts to think better of it. And yeah, her her family actually is kind of embarrassing. And she goes and visits his house, and it's a super hot house. Like, she's, she's really wet for the house. She starts to kind of soften on him just in time for Mr. Wickham to run off with her teen sister. This is, I think for obvious reasons now, a really scary situation. Like Lydia is 15 and people will be like, oh, it was different times. Maybe an officer running off with a 15 year old wasn't that bad. No, no, uh, times were not that different. Everybody reading the book, everybody within the universe of the story who heard that they had run off to Scotland would know that they are having sex. But the thing they're really freaking out over isn't, is he going to marry her? The thing they're worried about is, what if he doesn't marry her? Like They slowly come to the conclusion that actually he has no reason to. He's a cad and a fortune seeker. And Lydia has no fortune. They're just having sex. And then he's going to dump her somewhere. And Lydia will be ruined. This is obviously, like, gross and sexist, right? Like, if somebody's kidnapped your daughter, like, going, oh, no, he won't marry her, is is foreign to us in a way that I'm glad is very foreign to us. What we modern readers do often is boil this down to sexism, and that is what it is. But calling it just sexism flattens out the stakes, and I want to explain the hidden stakes behind this moment. Pride and Prejudice is set during the Georgian period, which is in the middle of the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution is in some ways the birth mother of capitalism, but capitalism didn't come out all in one push where we had mercantilism one day and capitalism the next. No, there were stages. David Graeber in Debt the First 5,000 Years, which is as much a history of money as it is of debt, describes how dock workers were paid in the 18th century. He says that, yeah, they were owed a salary and their bosses recorded that they were owed a salary, but they weren't paid a salary. What they did was they grabbed tools from off the job or they grabbed cargo from off the job 
and they took it home to, like, trade. Most common people and most nobility for most transactions did not like currency. Like, what are you going to do with gold? Gold is just a heavy rock. Governments imposed currency on people. They had wars to run. Gold was a spoil of war. And if you, as a shopkeeper, didn't accept gold, then you weren't going to supply an army. And armies don't like it when you refuse to supply an army. This is a completely different economy than the one we're used to. We trust cash. And they didn't in Georgian society. They trusted debt. They trusted that if they did somebody a major favor today, that person would pay them back tomorrow. That poses a problem because sometimes you do major, major, major favors for people. Like if you're a farmer and you give away all of the food that you grew and somebody doesn't pay you back, you starve to death. That's it. So how do you solve that trust problem? You keep your promises, of course, but then you also make sure that your entire family keeps their promises because if their reputation is bad, then why would anybody trust you? You also make sure that everybody that you hang out with is trustworthy. Like you make sure to shun anybody who is is a liar or his, is maybe even rude because rude people often don't keep their promises. There's still a few kinks to work out. Like even if you're a completely morally upstanding person, if there's a crisis like a famine or a flood, you're going to look out for your family first. That's only human. And that's going to be a source of betrayal. That's going to be a reason why people might not trust you. So if you do a lot of business with somebody, why not marry your son to their daughter? That way you share grandkids, you share family. So their good is your good. And wouldn't you know it, I have reinvented Georgian society. Now, there were additional things going on. Like they kind of used women as broodmares. You always know who the mother of a child is. You watch that kid come out. You don't always know who the father of a child is. Women at the time had to be really, really, really fastidious about maintaining their reputation. So a woman's entire life, everything she did, built up to the moment where she first held her child and she vouched for the fact that her husband is the father. Because if the child is not fathered by her husband, then the child's grandfathers are not related and they have no reason to trust one another and then the entire economy collapses. Women and their reputations were like load-bearing structures on the economy. When Lydia Bennett runs away with just some guy, nobody's going to believe after that that her children are her husband's children unless she marries him. That's not going to happen. And it throws her sisters and how they were raised and their character into question. Nobody's going to want to marry them. If they don't get married, there's nobody to take care of them. Mr. Collins, their cousin, is going to inherit the estate when their father dies. And why would he have four women, none of whom have the reputation to get married, on his land that would hurt his reputation. The Bennett sisters would have also had a very small amount of money, but unlike the Dashwood sisters from Sense and Sensibility, they wouldn't have had a friendly, distant cousin willing to take them in and help them make ends meet. They would have just been poor. The Georgian era is a miserable time to be poor. <laughs> Can't say it's much better now, but it, I think it was like probably worse. <laughs> probably. It's arguable. This news that Lydia has eloped reaches Elizabeth in front of Mr. Darcy, just as she's figuring out that he's not, by conventional standards of the time, a bad guy. Like, he might not be a good man, but he's not a bad guy, and she could really fall for him a little bit. And he excuses himself immediately because he can't be seen she thinks, in the company of somebody with her reputation. He's got to leave immediately. It's this mortifying moment of, I am never going to be a part of the same society as him ever again. It is good and right that a man of his stature would not want to be seen in a room with me 
and I was wrong about my family. I was wrong about who we are. And she's looking down the barrel of a lifetime of desperate poverty. And it's a horrible moment for her. And a lot of it isn't on the page because the readers from the time would have known. Is there ultimately a moment of revolution where Elizabeth Bennet is able to throw off the shackles of this unfair society? No, we have this horrible moment of questioning where we're asked to sit with a disgraced woman who we know is a good person, who we like. And that's all we really get. Because her love, Mr. Darcy, repairs her reputation and comes and sweeps her off her feet and they get married and they live happily ever after within the same society that nearly threw away Elizabeth Bennet. We're still waiting for Lizzie Bennet's moment of revolution. We're still living in a world where slut shaming exists, where sexism exists, where a few men own everything in the world. But we're in a place where we can, like Jane Austen did, question our society, question it through fiction, question it through games, make it fun, make it funny. I am definitely not saying that you are striking a major blow against capitalism and misogyny by running out and funding the Kickstarter for the They Came From the RPG Anthology with my chapter on the costume drama. I am saying, however, that I was given the writing assignment to find what is funny about all of this, about about this genre that I really love. And I think the first step to that is finding the pathos in it, finding the tension. I think this is it. I think this is the heart of what I wanted to get at and what I wanted to laugh at and what I wanted to defang when I wrote that chapter. We do this really cool thing for Onyx Path Kickstarters, where if you back even at the $5 level, we let you read the rough draft of the manuscript. Now, it doesn't have any art. Uh, it doesn't have a proofread yet, but it's still a playable game. Um, for a little bit more, you can get the PDF. And for this one, if we fully back the Kickstarter, we're going to have a beautiful like print run copy. And I would love it if I got to hold like a real print run of this book. Anyway, thank you to my Patreon supporters. And thank you, thank you, thank you to Matthew Dawkins, who gave me a shot on this book among many other things. Um, and I will see you all next time. See, I wore this because I thought it would be really evocative of the time period. And I'm wearing velvet in an 80 degree room under hot lights. <laughs> I'm